United Karate Concepts, give them another big hand. That is out, wow. <clears throat> now look, if you're just listening a little bit, you heard something that typically is founded on an Eastern philosophy based squarely upon the Lord Jesus Christ. A whole thing, uh, uh, the music in the background is, he is worthy to be praised. Outstanding, Master Leonard Haney and Carenza Haney, thank you so very much. Will you thank them one more time? They're doing this all across Tallahassee. And uh, Leonard, I think you actually kind of restarted the uh, uh, UKC right here in the lower level of our church. And still, uh, we have classes here, and he has classes in other places. If you're interested in that, and <clears throat> you saw several people uh, who are uh, a part of it uh, that are members of our church, and even one really old guy uh, who, uh, <clears throat> who, by the way, did you see him going at it here with his son? Uh, I'll tell you what, uh, that's... <laughs> 
My boys would have acted a whole lot different if I'd known that stuff. There he was just waiting in our old familiar place. An empty spot beside him where once I used to wait. To be filled with strength and wisdom for the battles of the day. I would have passed him by again but I clearly heard him say I miss my time with you Those moments together I need to be with you each day Well, it hurts me when you say You're too busy Busy trying to serve me but how can you serve me when your spirit's empty? There's a longing in my heart, wanting more than just a part of you. It's true. I miss my time with you. What will I have to offer? How could I truly care? My efforts have no meaning when your presence isn't there. But you provide the power if I take time to pray. I'll stay right here beside you and you'll never have to say I miss my time with you Those moments together I need to be with you each day And it hurts me when you say You're too busy Busy trying to serve me how can you serve me when your spirit's empty? There's a longing in my heart, wanting more than just a part of you. It's true. I miss my time with you. I miss my time with you Those moments together I need to be with you each day Well, it hurts me when you say you're too busy Busy trying to serve me Oh, but how can you serve me when your spirit is empty, there's a longing in my heart, wanting more than just a part of you. It's true. I miss my time with you. It's true. my time with you. Thank you so much, Mike, and again, thank all of you for being here today. If you'll take your Bibles, please, and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Uh, the title of the series is Heaven is for Real, and the title of the message today is Heaven's Call. Some of you have read the book. How many of you have read the book, Heaven is for Real? Would you raise your hand? You've read that book, Heaven is for Real. Uh, <clears throat> how many of you have seen the movie by the same name, Heaven is for Real? All right, thank you. 
Well, for the next few moments, I would like to lead us, uh, in the next few weeks, excuse me, I'd like to lead us on a tour of, um, of heaven and some heavenly days. But before we start, I, I do want to show you a trailer from the movie, and uh, this is about three minutes, and then I'll say just a couple of words, uh, not negative, but hopefully uh, helpful words. I've seen the movie and found it to be entertaining. But uh, if you'll just take a look at this, this is a trailer from Heaven is for Real. Mommy? Yes, Colton? Did you know I have a sister? You didn't know that Cassie's your sister? No, I have two sisters. You had a baby die in your tummy, didn't you? Honey, who told you I had a baby die in my tummy? In heaven, this little girl came up to me. She told me she died in your tummy. We need to get him in surgery right away. The pain that I suffered watching my son that close to death. We're in trouble here. He's much worse. Will you call some friends and pray for him? The hospital staff said that your son was not expected to survive. Use the word miracle. Your son had a near-death experience. He saw things that I can't really explain. I lifted up and I looked down. Mom was in one room. You were in another room yelling at God. He's been out there staring for hours. Is something wrong with Colton? Why do you say that? Sometimes he says weird things. I've been here. I don't think we've been here before, pal. You had a grandpa named Pop, right? He died when I was about your age. He's very nice. You saw my grandfather? Where did you see him? In heaven. Is this him? Is this the man you saw? No, in heaven, everybody's young. Is this him? Yeah, that's him. That's Pop. Honey, did you punch a kid in the nose? They were making fun of Colton. Yes, you gonna get a spanking. Heck no. She's gonna teach her to hit without hurting her knuckles. I want to believe him. But everything he talks about is impossible. You saw heaven? What does it look like? It's beautiful. We all want to be supportive, but we can't have our town turn into a circus. They don't believe me, do they? Some people might be afraid to believe. Don't you think we need to be talking about this life? Do you think my son went to heaven? You don't have to worry. He told me everything was all right. He's making a difference. Haven't we already had a glimpse of something? From the first cry of a baby, the courage of a friend, the love of a mother, the father, I see it. So I believe it. Do you? Well, that is a very uh, intriguing movie, and there was something that was said or put on the screen that uh, is very, um, I think, uh, descriptive of the movie. It says it's based on a true story. And what it didn't say, and, and I'm not being unkind, but it didn't say it was based on the Bible because it's not based on the Bible. Uh, it's, it's a good movie. Um, it's not a dirty movie. It's a family movie. And it does get people thinking about heaven. There are some things that are absent in the movie that if, if I were making the movie, if I ran the circus, uh, I would have uh, changed a few things. Uh, one of the things that I would have changed <clears throat> is that I would have put the presence of the gospel uh, in the movie. There is no gospel presence whatsoever uh, in the movie. It is <clears throat> all based on works, salvation, being good, believing, and uh, about heaven, and so on. Now, <clears throat> that being said, I'm not telling you to, to not go to the movie. I'm just asking you not to base your theology on a movie. Nobody should <clears throat> base their theology on a movie. Now, the Bible tells us a lot about heaven, and we know that in the heavenly city, there are certain characteristics. One of the characteristics is that there is no night, and uh, really, there are no days either because in heaven there is an eternal day. Revelation 22 and verse 5 says, And night will be no more. They will need no lamp, <clears throat> light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be in their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Now, with that understood, I want you <clears throat> to appreciate the fact that for 
the purposes of my own finite mind in organizing this series of messages, I'm going to speak of days in heaven. Understand that there is no sun up and sun down. There's just always the sun, and he is <clears throat> Jesus Christ in heaven. So with that being said, I want to speak about our first day in heaven when heaven calls. What happens to you and me when heaven calls? Second Corinthians chapter 5 says, beginning in verse 1, for we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, and so what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For, if we, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage and would rather be away from the body, and at home with the Lord. Now, for those of us who have been saved for some time, uh, we have experienced a lot of things in the course of our life, a lot of movies, a lot of stories, a lot of uh, uh, <clears throat> rumors and myths, and, and even some songs that, uh, that we think are scriptural, but, or we think are, are, are spiritual, but they have no scriptural foundation. Uh, in a few weeks, I'm going to, um, <clears throat> and maybe this week, as far as I know right now, I can't remember, but I'm going to, in the I Am series, talk about a couple of unscriptural tunes that we have, uh, some of us have known for a long time, and some people have loved for a long time. There is a <clears throat> song that says, uh, from way back when I was a kid, Lord, build me just a cabin, in the corner of glory land. How many of you re have ever heard that song? <clears throat> Lord, build me just a cabin in the corner. Of, and it was a catchy little gospel kind of a song back in the day, totally unscriptural. There's <clears throat> no spiritual or scriptural basis whatsoever. I was thinking about another song. When I was deciding to, to uh, do this thing, I was thinking about a, a song that my brother used to sing in his gospel quartet. And I actually sang it with him. Uh, it's called <clears throat> It's a Great uh, Morning, and, uh, or Your First Day of, in Heaven is what it's called. How many of you have heard Your First Day in Heaven? A few of you have heard that. And <clears throat> it's a very interesting and catchy tune. And, and the truth is I, I kind of wish that our gospel quartet could sing it because it's really a catchy tune, totally unscriptural though. And <clears throat> so it may not be a good thing. I, I think that... that uh, we want to be very careful about dealing with things in heaven uh, in an unscriptural way. So with the exception of creating a daily atmosphere in heaven, I'm going to do my best to stay true to the Bible. What happens when heaven calls? Well, <clears throat> the first thing is that we discover our wake-up call. When heaven calls, <clears throat> it is our wake-up call. Now let's talk about the wake-up call we receive when heaven calls. People die in all kinds of circumstances. Every kind of circumstance you can imagine could be a circumstance whereby people die. I may have mentioned this a few weeks ago. I'll mention it again. I was scheduled for a procedure at a medical facility, and the medical facility called me to ask me a series of questions. They wanted to <clears throat> pre-admit me, if you will. And so they asked these questions, and one was, do you have sleep apnea? And I told them that I didn't think so, but that my wife tells me that sometimes I stop breathing uh, while I am sleeping. And the lady on the, uh, at the hospital, wherever it was I was going, she said, you know, you do know <clears throat> that people uh, die from that. And I, I said, well, doesn't everyone want to go in their sleep? <clears throat> she said, well, that's really a good point. And then she moved on to some other... <laughs> <clears throat> other questions. So whether we die 
peacefully in our sleep or we die violently uh, in an accident, we're going to wake up in eternity. And when we get that wake-up call, here's the first thing we're going to see, relocation. <clears throat> we have absolutely moved. Here's a familiar passage from uh, Luke chapter 16 and verse 22. The poor man died and was carried by the angel to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. He, and he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am anguished in this flame. Now our text told us uh, what we've always known in the King James Version as to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That means when this life is over, for the saved, we go into immediately into the presence of God. Now the reason for this is because the work of Christ is finished and there is no waiting. There is no waiting room. Uh, this text that we just saw, um, and it's hard for me to, to tell you this and really not get into a big long doctrinal thing, but <clears throat> this was a place of waiting prior to uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the ascension of Jesus Christ. This was a place where, um, where Lazarus was, and then the Bible teaches that across this great gulf there was also uh, this rich man who had gone <clears throat> to hell. So it was a place called paradise, and, uh, and that's where it was. Now, uh, Christ has finished his work, and there is no waiting to claim the souls. Uh, I believe this. I do believe that when Jesus said, it is finished, uh, I believe that, that what he was talking about was not so much his life as it was, as his earthly life as it was the plan, and that he would uh, gather those souls that were waiting for the plan to be completed, and they would all be in his presence as we will be in his presence at the end <clears throat> of this life. Now, I appreciate the fact that there are many, many, many people who do not believe in heaven or hell. There are a lot of people that believe that you die and that's it, kaput, no more, see ya, nada, it's gone, no more. <clears throat> there are a lot of people that believe that, and I appreciate that they believe that. I don't believe that. I don't think that you believe that. It's like Billy Graham told the atheist one time. He said, if I'm wrong, I've wasted a lifetime, but if you're wrong, you've wasted an eternity. And with all of my heart <clears throat> in all of this lifetime, I believe that, there, that heaven is for real. And I believe that there's a place called heaven and we go there by faith in Jesus Christ. The <clears throat> series and the, the message is about heaven being for real. But we should understand that hell is for real too. This isn't a series <clears throat> about hell, but if there is a heaven, there is a hell. In fact, here's an interesting fact. There's more taught about hell in the Word of God than about heaven. You can find more references to the punishments of hell than the glories of heaven in the Word of God. Doesn't mean that we ought to emphasize hell, but it does mean that, that hell is just as real as heaven is. So only salvation through Jesus Christ will guarantee us a relocation in heaven. We're going to relocate somewhere. For the saved, the saved are going to relocate at the end of this life in the presence of God or in heaven. Uh, for the lost, they're going to relocate in the lake of fire, in torment, or in hell. Pastor Ray, isn't that an awful reality? Oh, it's a terrible reality. That's why we dedicate our ministry and lives to sharing the truth of the gospel, whereby people can be assured of going to heaven. You know, Jesus died on the cross for our sins so that no one, he is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So when you get your wake-up call someday at the end of this life, it's going to be in heaven or in hell. And here's the second thing. There's going to be a realization. Uh, all of us remember uh, the Wizard of Oz and Dorothy when her house landed in Oz and it had all of its colors and unusual sights. And she said to her dog, Toto, you remember what she said? I don't think we're in Kansas anymore. Well, I think there's going to be an instant realization. I don't think we're in Tallahassee anymore. On a, a very serious and blessed note, <clears throat> when we leave this life for the next, 
we're going to realize immediately that life on earth is over. I don't believe there's going to be, I wonder what this is. I believe that we'll realize immediately. And I'm sure that all of us have known people who were very much aware that life was about to end. And sometimes they're in such peace about it. And sometimes they're in terrible turmoil about it. But I will tell you this, that once life is over, they are in full knowledge of it that things have changed. They are now in a relocation and they realize it. If many or any can know when life is fading, then there certainly is an instant realization when earthly life is over. Now, I don't really think that it'll be a shock, that is, if you go to heaven. I don't think that, that if you die in this life, and, and this is just, a, it seems to me, so you can take it or leave it, uh, <clears throat> but I don't think that, if, that when you die and you wake up in heaven, you go, oh my goodness, I'm in heaven. I don't, I don't think that you'll be like that. Now, I do think that people who go to hell will be in shock, uh, if nothing else, that the, the mere uh, torment of it and the horror of, <clears throat> of that terrible uh, place. But if we're in heaven, I think that, that we're in a realization of eternal life. And I think it's a wonderful realization. Like I said earlier, there are many people <clears throat> who realize before they die that they're about to die. How many of you have known somebody <clears throat> who you feel confident knew that they were about to die? Would you raise your hand? All right. <clears throat> I think we've all known people like that. Here's a couple of interesting stories along those lines, little mini stories. <clears throat> George Harrison, uh, one of the Beatles, you may recall one of the Beatles. He's the one that <clears throat> wrote My Sweet Lord, and in the song it said Hare Krishna and, and all of that. <clears throat> Here's a story that you may not know. George Harrison got saved before he died. We used to support a missionary <clears throat> who was a missionary basically to celebrities, more along the lines of racing people. His name was Max Helton, and Max Helton was witnessing to Emerson Fittipaldi one time at a, uh, a racetrack, and George Harrison walked up, and uh, he, uh, uh, Emerson Fittipaldi said, hello, George, and, and George said, Emerson, and he said, who is this? And he said, this is my friend Max. He's trying to tell me how to have a happy life. And George said, I wish somebody could tell me. And he said, well, I'll be glad to tell you. One thing led to another, and over a period of time, as <clears throat> George Harrison was led through Scripture and through some Bible studies, George Harrison wrote Max Helton an email. And, he <clears throat> he said, and Max Helton told me this with his own mouth. He said, George Harrison said, Max, I want you to know that if I don't, and he had cancer, knew he was dying. He said, I want you to know that if I, <clears throat> if I don't make it, that uh, I'll see you in heaven. I've been reading the materials, and I have accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. And I will see you in heaven, <clears throat> Max. And his last words on this earth, George Harrison's last words, very interesting, was love one another. It was an interesting last words. Another guy that's not so famous as uh, George Harrison, and I don't really have a story with him, is Bob Marley. Bob Marley wrote, Money Can't Buy Life. <clears throat> you remember Bo Diddley, some of you uh, uh, old guys out there? Bo Diddley said, I'm going to heaven, I'm coming home. I <clears throat> kind of like that. The famous Baptist pastor D.L. Moody used to say, someday you'll read in the papers that D.L. Moody of East Northfield is dead. Don't believe a word of it. At <clears throat> that moment I shall be more alive than I am now. When D.L. Moody, <clears throat> when D.L. Moody, the great evangelist, was dying, his last dying words were, earth recedes, heaven opens before me. If this is death, it is sweet. There is no valley here. God is calling me, and I must go. His son said to him, no, no, father, you're just dreaming. To which Moody replied, I am not dreaming. I have been within the gates. I have seen the children's faces. His last words were, this is my triumph. This is my coronation day. It is glorious. I believe with all of my heart that we're going to have a full realization when we step into heaven what has taken place, what has happened to us. Not only that, we're going to have a recreation. That looks like recreation up there, and heaven will be recreation, but there will be a recreation. The spirit of man does not die. It just moves from one place to another. We bury our body so our spirit, the person we are, uh, moves on into the presence of God or it moves on into eternal torment. 
It's one or the other. <clears throat> now, I'd like to be able to offer you purgatory. I, I know that there are great religions that uh, offer purgatory, but uh, there's real no, really no scriptural basis for purgatory, so I can't offer it to you. Sometimes I wish Baptists had purgatory because I'd like to threaten some Baptists that don't go to church like they ought and so on. I'd like to threaten them with purgatory, but I can't and because uh, there is no purgatory. It's one or the other, and we're either <clears throat> in heaven or we're in hell, and there is a recreation of sorts. The Bible says, tells us that what we will be like in our glorified bodies, that is that we will be like Jesus. But our glorified bodies does not come to us until our spirit re reunites with Jesus at, <coughs> with our, excuse me, with our, our earthly bodies at the resurrection. That's what we've just come through talking about the resurrection. You do understand that those people that are buried at Cully's Meadowood out here that uh, right now it's just their body there. But at the return of Jesus Christ, uh, that is at the rapture, they are going to reu reunite uh, with their spirit and there's going to be a, a heavenly body. Now, what is it like now? And, uh, what is it like today? I don't really know what it's like, but I will tell you this, that <clears throat> there is some sort of a spiritual body that will enable us to recognize each other. I believe that we will know each other in heaven. I believe that there will come a day where we'll have a glorified body just like Jesus. And we'll, we'll probably talk more about this. In fact, I'm sure that we will. But you recall that in his glorified body, that is after his resurrection, Jesus just appeared places. He just appeared, you know, in a room. And, and I don't know that that <clears throat> means that he walked through walls or whatever, but he just appeared in different places. That'd be a cool thing, wouldn't it? Just to be able to appear somewhere. And, uh, you know, like this afternoon, man, I'd like to go to Disney for an afternoon. <coughs> Boom, there you are at Space Mountain. Uh, <coughs> I don't know exactly what it's going to be like, but there is going to be a, <coughs> a body that is a, a glorified body after the resurrection. But until then, there's some sort, some sort of a spiritual body, and <coughs> there is a, a recognition of that spiritual body. And remember that that rich man that was in hell even recognized the beggar Lazarus. So there was recognition. And then there's this from the transfiguration in Matthew 17 and verse 1. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with them. Now, you have to understand that they recognized Moses and Elijah, that Moses and Elijah weren't just some wisp. They <clears throat> recognized Moses and Elijah. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we're here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, which is a very interesting, interesting thing. So <clears throat> for the saved... Heaven's call is going to be a, a wake-up call. Uh, we're going to have a, a realization. We're going to have a relocation. And, and there will be a, a recreation. We'll have some sort of a different body. It won't be a corruptible body. It will be a, <clears throat> an incorruptible uh, body. That is for the saved. For the lost, there's another wake-up call. And, and that's a horrifying eternity. Now, the second thing that I want to give you concerning our first day in heaven is total recall. Now, this is an interesting and powerful thing. In verse 12 of 1 Corinthians 13, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. The instant knowledge of our eternal state intrigues and it excites me. I believe that this one verse teaches us that in heaven we will have total recall. Now there is the suggestion that, uh, there, there is not the suggestion that we will recall uh, uh, just the good things. There will probably be some things that we regret that we recall. And, and we're going to get to the point where we talk about all tears being wiped away. But to be honest with you, all tears aren't wiped away until the, to the end of the uh, rewards that are given and and so forth and so on and we'll talk about that later now I don't believe that we'll uh, sit there and have great regret over sin and the reason that I don't believe we'll have regret over sin is because our sins have been forgiven 
all of our sins have been forgiven. Any regret that we might have, I think, may be that I didn't do more for the Lord. But it won't be over the sin. You'll have to recall that uh, speaking to Israel with, that the, with the same heart that he has for you and me, here's what God said about sin. Jeremiah 31, 34. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and, and each his brother, saying, excuse me, <clears throat> know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. I believe that in heaven there are many aha moments. I believe in heaven that we have total recall. Let's talk about it. I think we'll have <clears throat> total recall of mortal life. The Bible says that we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. That's Hebrews 12 and verse 1. Who is that great cloud of witnesses? Well, it's the people around us. <clears throat> and I believe that it's the people that have also gone to heaven. Now, why do you think that? Well, the Bible also says there's joy in the presence of angels over one sinner who comes to repentance. That means that people in heaven have an awareness of what's going on <clears throat> on the earth. Now, I don't for a moment think that we are preoccupied with it. I do believe, I do believe that my, my father, well, let, let me put it to you this way. I, I, Lindsay's grandmother was a, a Christian. Ari was her name. I believe that she's aware that Lindsay has given a ba a birth to a baby, and that little baby girl is named after her. I believe that she's aware of that. Now, do I think that, that she or any of us hang over the banisters of heaven and spend all of our time watching it? No, watching the earth? I don't think so. My wife's um, uh, washing machine went out. I shouldn't say my wife's. I, we, we both do laundry. <clears throat> oh, I'm going to tell you, that hurts right there. <clears throat> because we both do. Jan Ray, does your honey, honey baby do laundry? That's right, I do laundry. <clears throat> So we got her a new washing machine and, and us a new washing machine. <clears throat> and uh, we, because of the way that our, our laundry room is, it's not situated where we can get one of those uprights, you know, that's got the thing in the front, you know, and because it's, it's just not a deep enough thing. You don't get clearance from the door for that. I won't go into it. So <clears throat> we bought another kind. That, that is, you know, kind of typical. It's the top load and the front down. But it has glass windows. And, and it's so different from the way that things... I mean, washing machines are different now. And, and I, I've just spent a lot of time just standing over the washing machine. <laughs> just, I mean, it's amazing, really, to me. I just watch that thing. I don't think in heaven that's what we do. I don't think we get to heaven and go, wow, look at that. I don't think there's like this viewing window where we all lean over and say, man, oh man, look at that. But by the same token, I don't think that we forget mortal life just because we're in heaven. In fact, we have total recall in heaven. We have a total recall in heaven and about our mortal life, and I think we have total recall about Bible truth. <clears throat> Another thing that will come clear to us are the things of the Bible that we do not understand. How many of you have something about the Bible that you do not understand? Would you raise your hand? Oh, wonderful. Several of you know it perfectly. <clears throat> There's a lot in Scripture that I don't understand. And I'm not trying to understand. Now, I know people, they just, I mean, they twist their heads all up and down trying to figure out stuff that's not figure outable. I, could I tell you this? I do not understand the doctrine of election. I don't understand it. I don't understand the sovereignty of God. I don't understand any level of predestination. I don't, <clears throat> I don't understand that. There's a lot of stuff that I don't understand. In fact, I'm maybe moving on Wednesday night to a series dealing with, with some of those kinds of things. But I don't understand any of those things. Now, to me, that's a good thing. Because if I were able to figure out God, then God wouldn't be all that God. Here's what Isaiah said for my, or concerning the Lord. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declare the Lord. 
Now, when we get to heaven, we're going to have some recall, some total recall. We're going to understand some things. In fact, we'll understand things we didn't even think of in this earth. The Bible teaches us that we will have a a great and a tremendous knowledge when we get there. Those things that we didn't know on this side uh, that even could be known will be known on the other side. And here's another thing. There's total recall concerning the will of God. I can't explain the will of God. I can't explain. Look, I don't understand how God and why God directed my paths in the way that he directed. If I were laying out the map for my life, it would have been a lot different. It really would have. I would have certainly married Jan. And all of those things. But there are other things that have just been different. I've got six sisters. Most of of them who used to do embroidery. There's a difference between embroidery and needlepoint. And my sisters used to do embroidery. And, and embroidery involved a cloth that was clamped real tightly on a ring, and, and it had an upper side to it, and, and there was a pattern uh, to follow on the upper side. But from the underside, it was just a mess. <clears throat> there was nothing about it that seemed orderly or, or beautiful. It was just a bunch of colors and strings hanging down in random arrangement, and really kind of ugly. But on the upper side the pattern was very clear and it was often very beautiful and it made sense it was a picture being developed by a crooked path from below but in perfect order from above to see it from below was confusion but to see it from above was beauty when heaven calls we will immediately see our lives from above That which was disorganized and stringy will show itself to be a thing of beauty from above. That's why we trust God. That's why we trust His hand. Because we know that God, all things work together for good to them that love the Lord, to them who are called according to His purpose. God is doing something. And because God is doing something, we... We submit to God's hand even when it doesn't look pretty from our side because we know there's going to come a day where we have total recall and on that day and from that perspective we'll see it clearly. You remember the song, It Will Be Worth It All. The words say, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of his dear face, all sorrow will erase, so bravely run the race till we see Christ. We're talking about the day that heaven calls. I don't know when that day is going to be. I really don't. The longer I live, the looser I hold to this earth. That's the truth now. I don't hold to this earth as tightly as I used to. I hold to it more loosely than I did. Whenever that day comes, there's going to be a wake-up call for me. <clears throat> there's going to be a, a total recall. And then there's going to be a series of personal calls. This is your first day in heaven. What are the series of personal calls? Well, that's when the reunions begin. I'm sure that in the course of this message, we're going to expand on this list. In fact, I know that we will. But here's a short overview of what it'll be to go to heaven and make some personal calls that we've been wanting to make. First of all, we'll meet God Now, I've already met him, I just haven't seen him. I've already met Jesus, I just haven't laid eyes on him. And I will gladly tell you that to comprehend what that moment will be like, uh, to see God is more than my thoughts can tell. It's too grand to imagine. When we sang earlier, I can only imagine. I love that song. I think it's a wonderful song. But maybe it should be written, I can't even imagine. Because I can't imagine what it's like to stand before the Lord. I just, I can't believe. I can't imagine what it's going to be like to see Jesus with my own eyes. But I do believe this. I believe that seeing Jesus will be one of the first calls that we'll make. I believe I will see him. We'll meet Jesus. And then... The second 
series of personal calls will be those reuniting calls, those reunion calls. Here in this church, we've lost many dear friends and family members. I pastored the former church that I came from for 15 and a half years, and there was never one death in the church, not one. 15 and a half years, not one person died who was in our fellowship. I've been here for over 22 years, and I cannot, I cannot, I've got, I've got lists of them, but it's hard for me to imagine the number of people who have, who have passed on. So there are going to be some, some reunions. I personally miss these people. And beyond those who have gone from us in this body, <clears throat> there are those in our family who have gone as well. I received a phone call right after I became the pastor of this church. I received a phone call that my brother had died in Texas, in Dallas, Texas. <clears throat> I remember immediately several people came over. And I could start calling names, but, but I certainly remember, I've already mentioned Aubrey and Betty. I remember Aubrey and Betty, and I remember Bill and Sybil. <clears throat> and there were so many that came over. And they sat in my house, and, and I, my brother was in Texas, and, and I remember, Sybil, I remember Bill doing this. Uh, I, I remember Bill saying, now, preacher, we'll get you an airplane and send you over there if you need to. I remember him saying that to me. And I thought to myself, my goodness, what a wonderful and kind, generous man. God had blessed him, and he would have done it. He, he sure would have, wouldn't he? I, if I said, Bill, I, I just don't think I can make it any other way, he would have done it. I, I miss so many wonderful people. I miss my brother, my dad. I miss my mom. On Mother's Day, my second mom is going to be here. That's my, old, my second oldest sister who actually raised me to a, to a great measure. She's going to be here, and uh, I love her. I was telling on Wednesday night service, she's, she has dementia, so, you know, she's in and out on a couple of things. She's a sweetheart, an absolute sweetheart. Some of you will get there before I do, and you'll have a chance to meet my mom. You'll have a chance to meet my dad. You'll have a chance to meet my brother Butch, you'll have a chance to meet a little baby that we don't even know if she was a boy or if he was, if she, or, or, or if he was a girl. You'll meet a little baby that Jan and I was supposed to be our first child. You'll meet a little baby that maybe you have sent on to heaven. All of that is true and all of that is very real when we get to heaven. There's some personal calls, meeting God, the reu reuniting, and then finally meeting the saints. You'll see, you'll get a chance to meet up with people. You'll meet up with my family and I'll meet up with yours, but we're all going to meet up with other people we've just heard about and read about, the apostles and the hall of fame of Hebrews 11. We're going to meet these wonderful people. We're going to have a chance to interact with Abraham and Isaac and Moses. We're going to have a chance to talk to Mary, the mother of Jesus. We're going to have that chance. You say, well, how will we all have the chance? I mean, won't the line be so long we'll never get around to it? Oh, there's no lines in heaven. It's eternal. It's eternal. Everything is is available in heaven. We'll get a chance to talk to them. All of this begs the one question, and I, I'm going to ask this and then I'm finished. Are you ready when heaven calls? Are you ready? Do you know for sure that if you died today, you'd go to the, this wonderful place called heaven? I think that you believe that heaven is for real, but do you believe that you for real have a chance to be there? I will tell you this, not based on who I am as a pastor, not based on what I've done by way of stewardship or what I've done by way of any good works. I will tell you this, that I'm going to heaven when I die. I don't have any question about it. I don't, I don't, if you ask me, 
if you died, would you go to heaven? I wouldn't say, oh, I hope so. I think I will. No, I say, yes, I will. And the reason is because I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. And one day as a little boy, I said to the Lord, Lord, I'm just a little boy. I don't know what to do. Please save me. And he heard my innocent prayer, and he saved me. And the power that saved an eight-year-old was the power that could keep a, a guy saved until he was 18 years old and 28 and all of these years up until today. And you can know that power of salvation yourself by personally receiving Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You have been watching the Family Bible Hour, a ministry of North Florida Baptist Church in Tallahassee, Florida. If you would like a copy of today's message on CD or DVD, write to us at Family Bible Hour, 3000 North Meridian Road, Tallahassee, Florida, 32312. Visit us online at nflchurch.com or call us at 850-385-7181. Join us again next time for the Family Bible Hour.